Thanks, Max, and thanks everybody for coming. I'm really excited to be here. This is fun. I've gotten to do, um, since the book came out in September, I've gotten to do a few different events, a lot of them at colleges, um, but this is my first corporate event. Uh, and it's nice because Google is basically a big college. So I, I appreciate being here. I mean, note the chairs too, uh, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, this this makes it seem like I'm a film director. Like we're we're here to discuss our uh, our latest film. Uh, <laughs> Which we, we, we could try to do that after. I'll just start by showing a few uh, images from. I, so I started, um, I've been a teacher since I graduated college, uh, started a blog about five years ago, um, wanted to do, uh, wanted to write about math, knew that math needed visuals, uh, also knew that I can't draw, it's just not in my skill set, so figured I would like disclaim it up front. It's going to be math with bad drawings. Uh, so I figured I'll just show a few images from, from my, uh, my writing and my, my rather unlikely illustrating career so far. So this was right after, like, I think, the month I started the blog. Uh, and this is still probably one of the, uh, I don't know, the, the better known, the more popular pieces of writing that I've done. Uh, which, and you can see the, uh, my illustration style was still developing. Uh, <laughs> that's me, and, and I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to be pulling out hair. Like that's you know tufts of hair in my hands, which is just a grotesque idea for a drawing. Among also not not being the best piece of execution. I uh, think I didn't quite understand that the first time that I looked at it. Uh, uh, that that was what he was holding there. Yeah, I think you're not alone. Yeah, it yeah. just looks. <laughs> it's just like sort of horns or something. I don't know. Uh, I also learned pretty soon that I hands are just a losing battle. You don't want to try to draw hands. Uh, anyway, but so this essay um, yeah is one of the first things I did on the blog and. One of the things I was really interested in, especially right when I started writing about mathematics, moving from having taught it for four years at that point to trying to reach a larger audience, was math phobia and math anxiety and this whole suite of, uh, of almost psychiatric problems that people have when they think about math. Uh, and so this actually, I mean, like most of my writing, it's, it's a very kind of breezy, silly piece with some jokes in it. Uh, it was incredibly hard to write. It's an essay about a uh, math class I took senior year of college that I struggled in. Uh, and when I sat down to write it, there was like, I was about 500 or 1,000 words deep. And it was all disclaimers of like, well, just so you know, I'm actually, I'm actually pretty good at this stuff. So it's not, it's not that I'm bad at it. And, and I just like, the idea of actually looking directly at where I had struggled and where I had failed in this class. Uh, it, was, it was like looking at the sun. It was really hard to just bring my, my focus towards that. Uh, and in some sense, I, most of the writing I've done since then flows out of that, I think, trying to, um, to look at the experience, which is really not fun to look at, but of, of being in a math class, running into something that you don't understand and just kind of feeling like an idiot. Uh, which is something, if you, if you take enough math, you wind up there. I mean, everybody has that experience at one point or another. Um, anyway, and so that, that was sort of from the start something that I was thinking about uh, with the blog. Um, sort of another piece I was a year or two later, a similar angle, and you can see my, uh, my drawing style evolving, um, basically not trying to do as much. <laughs> no, no noses, no hands. This was in the midst of uh, what I call my long neck phase, where all my stick figures had <laughs> necks that were much too long. Um, and, and also sort of, I think, understanding what, as someone who has no background in, in drawing and really no, uh, no <coughs> comfort with it as a, as a medium or as a skill, uh, what can I do is like basically try to come up with some concepts for images and have the concept override my, my lack of technique. Uh, so this was one where I think a, a common kind of meme in the culture around mathematics is that you hit some maximum point. Uh, for some people, it's algebra one. For some people, it's their trigonometry or calculus class in high school. For some people, they take you know, abstract algebra, and they start learning about rings and fields, and that's where they sort of fall off the wagon. And there's this notion that it's like, yeah, that there's a ceiling, that you can advance math as hierarchical, you climb the ladder, then you get to a rung, and it's like, oh, you can't go past that one. Just your lungs don't work that high, uh, which I think, I think is wrong. Um, I don't think that's how it works, but it's a very authentic experience that people have. Uh, so this, the, I sort of show this just as an example of the kind of, I don't know, the, the, the kind of cartooning I do. Uh, my metaphor is um, this futon, which uh, it was freshman year of college. You, 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 may, you may remember this, actually. The guys on the first floor in our, yeah, you were the same entryway, yeah. Uh, the guys on the first floor wanted to get rid of their futon, so they very nicely carried it up to the fourth floor for us. And along the way, uh, like a little piece broke off. And we were like, ah, oh, a little piece. It was like this little piece of metal. It did seem fine. Um, and then, like a week later, the futon was doing that. And then two weeks later, it was sort of like that, <laughs> dumping in the middle. And then, like eventually, it took like a month or two, and then the futon was broken. And I think that 
to me isn't a bad metaphor for what happens in, in math education, where there's a little piece that's missing. You know, I, I, I've taught eighth grade, so you know, algebra one student can graph some lines. Maybe doesn't really get what that's about. Doesn't I get the idea of sort of the correspondence between this equation and the points on the line or x, y pairs that satisfy the equation? Um, there's just some missing understanding. And it seems fine in eighth grade, because they can answer all the questions. But as you build further, the futon kind of starts to warp. Uh, and then at some point, there's a collapse. Uh, I think that's what people experience as a ceiling in math education. It's not actually them hitting some kind of cognitive limit of what they can understand. It's, um, it's sort of old fractures finally leading to a rupture. Some other more recent drawings. This one was uh, um, a fun piece to do. This actually wound up in the book, too. Uh, Partly I show this, right? This is from 2015. It really, it doesn't make sense after 2016, I think. Because in 2015, it felt like a credible critique of political journalists, that they're always trying to hype up the unlikely possibilities. Um, and then with the 2016 election, surprising a lot of people, um, the, I, this is one that I had, I had to change for the book, because I wanted to, I, of course, I wanted to make fun of political journalists. But this was no longer sort of the right, the right joke for that. Um, <laughs> Is there an updated version later uh, in the uh, slides here? Actually, I don't have it in the slide that's in. You gotta, this, is the, this is the teaser for the book. Oh, nice. I've got to go obtain the book. Um, and this, this is another one that winds up in the book, Why Not to Trust Statistics. Um, this one, you can see, very, very much in my long neck phase. It's really yeah, very long. Wow. It's really disproportionate. Wait, yeah. can I pause you for a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. You're, you, are you drawing these on, on whiteboards? No, actually. So originally, yeah. So back at the very beginning, I spent a year drawing on whiteboards. I thought it was a really good idea to photograph the pens. <laughs> I don't know. People would ask me sometimes, like, why do you do that? I'm like, that's, that's the key to the whole thing. <laughs> and it really, I don't think it was. A year later, I stopped doing it. And like, I've never gotten an email from someone being like, where are the whiteboard men? <laughs> I miss those. Uh, so then, yeah, then uh, right at this point, I was actually using, I mean, this is still what I do, is just Sharpie on paper, and I scan it. OK, because um, I was wondering how you got like that faded area from a whiteboard marker. I don't think I would know how to do that. Sure, yeah, no, no, color, no colored I pencil. I you didn't. OK, Yeah, cool. yeah. yeah very, very high tech. It's Sharpies and, and like Crayola colored pencils. Oh, that's great. Uh, so this one was, I guess, right, this is now three years into the blog. Um, and I think I was moving towards, right, I wanted to do simpler drawings because uh, they are easier. And also, it looks if you do it like this, it looks like maybe I could actually draw real things. And it's just I'm choosing to do something kind of deliberately minimalist and simplistic, uh, which, which is a lot. That's not true. I, can't, I really can't draw anything more complex. But if you do it, if you have the right kind of simple style, you can almost pull it off. Um, and and this, was, I, this was, I was, I was moving towards, like I said, started, I had agents by this point and was starting to think about the book, although I hadn't, uh, I hadn't uh, gotten into contact with my editor yet, so the, so the book project hadn't come together. Um, but this was the sort of thing I knew I wanted to maybe build a book around, is just jokes that explain simple math ideas. Um, so this one, you can sort of imagine, you guys know how means work. So right, mean is very sensitive to the, or right, mean is the total divided by the number of things there are. It's not sensitive to distribution, so this is a plausible. <laughs> <laughs> I really I can't look at these drawings anymore because the necks are so long and the legs are so short. Anyway, yeah, well, it, the faces have always been my focus. This is really uh, upsetting. Um, and then this one wound up floating around Twitter, but it was sort of, <laughs> that's, probably, that's probably the best joke I've written. It's, it's just like, I don't know, it's got, it feels like a joke I discovered rather than writing. It's just like a very simple joke that felt like it was there already. Um, and it, like, it was doing really well on Twitter, and, but I hadn't tweeted it out. Someone else had tweeted it out without attributing it to me, so the dangers of, uh, of social media. Mostly I'm just trying to claim, claim my credit belatedly. Uh, um, this that may have been in the essay that went along with this particular cartoon, but I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Is the claim here that there was, you're explaining why there was one time uh, that was both the best and the worst uh, of times? I guess, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, it's my best joke. I can't say I've read Tale of Two Cities. OK. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful, I've read the opening paragraph. It's a lovely opening paragraph. I assume because it's two cities in the title, I assume one of them it's real good and one of them it's real bad there. Yeah. Uh, um, but don't ask me what the two cities are. <laughs> Paris has got to be one. Anyway. Um, and then this is a more recent essay. And this is, again, actually, I write, so at this point, sort of five years in, um, I, I guess if you'd asked me in 2013 if I was going to have five or more years of things to say about mathematics, doing sort of a poster to a week, and lately I've been doing sort of four cartoons a week, um, I think I might not have been too optimistic about continuing to have fresh ideas. Um, but to some extent, I mean, this is what I think what writing 
almost anything is, is finding fresh ways to, to present or to discuss old insights. Um, so one of the one of my favorite essays I've written, uh, which isn't in the book but may may appear in a future book, um, was about. I actually got the chance to ask a question of Andrew Wiles, uh, who was you know the the mathematician who proved Fermat's last theorem after this 350 year chase to try to figure out what the uh, yeah what what this lost proof was, which clearly Fermat did not have. Uh, and so I got to ask Wiles, sort of, what's your if you you, you get in a way that research mathematicians don't usually, he gets a chance to speak to a much wider audience, right? He's, he's sort of a, a figure in the popular imagination. And what's the message that he tries to send when he gets those chances? Uh, and what he said was um, basically that mathematics is about being stuck and being comfortable with being stuck. Uh, and that to solve problems is to, is to kind of glory in that, in that phase where You've entered, you see what the problem is, you see what the destination is you're trying to get to, you just don't know how to get there. Uh, and to grow comfortable with that and to grow to enjoy that process. Uh, and he, he said it really beautifully, so I just sort of did some cartoons and a little bit of my own prose elaborating on that. Um, but that's still, in any given week, that's probably one of the more visited uh, posts on my blog because it's, um, it's a sort of a timeless message. That's something, I mean, which makes sense for a guy who spent a decade solving a 350-year-old problem. He's, he's good at coming up with fairly timeless wisdom. Uh, and, and then, yeah, universal. and so this leads to sort of the... There's a pretty universal idea, too. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, it stretches beyond math, I think. Yeah. Um, this is my wife's favorite joke. She's a research mathematician. Um, and I don't... That's, that's, that's not the absolute best joke, but, you know, it makes her happy. Uh, I've been doing more more cartoons lately, trying to... You can see my, my illustration, you can see it's getting better. Those necks are much more proportionate. Uh, the oven almost has a plausible geometry to it, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of I'm it. very impressed with the oven. Yeah, Thank you, yeah, the, yeah, uh, let's, let's go back to the, that. Yeah, the... Yeah, the <laughs> The glass on the front door of the, well, the only door of the oven. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Max. You're yeah, welcome. That's exactly right. That was, I'll tell you, that's, that's an afternoon right there to, <laughs> to make that happen. Uh, and then, yeah, and then actually recently, so right, my first book came out in September, and I've got another one with the same publisher coming out. Um, I, we don't have a publication date yet, but probably this fall. Um, and so that, that's been fun working on that. It's uh, uh, about calculus. So, you know, the mathematics of change. Um, and the illustrations are black and white, which actually I, I just sort of thought was, Kind of classy, I don't know. Um, and I liked, I, I liked the challenge of trying to, because usually I rely on color as kind of a crutch. It's like, look, it's green and blue, and don't worry about how poorly drawn it is. Uh, and so having to do it with, with black and white was, was fun to work on. Those are some of the uh, more recent drawings. I've got red, too. You can see the, the bloodshot eyes of the, uh, the waiting child. Yeah, no, the uh, child really seems to be in distress there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I find Very myself, graphic. sometimes when I'm, when I'm drawing faces like that, I, like, I'll catch myself kind of making the face. This is the level of a sort of amateur artist I am. It's like I can't actually draw a panic person without like, reminding myself what panic feels like. Or maybe, maybe that makes me a great artist. I don't know. <laughs> I bet a lot of us would do that if we were, uh, if we were you know, drawing yeah. panic like that. Yeah, I, I like to think so. Anyway, yeah, so those are just some images from uh, right, that sort of spans my, uh, my whole artistic career, which uh, I think <laughs> if, you, if you would tell my sisters, who have always known me as a... Uh, utterly incompetent artist. The first time, I had a, a blog post that wound up at the Huffington Post. They, they you know, read it on their homepage. And the byline they wrote for me without asking me was, uh, like, writer and artist. And my sisters both called me within, like, 30 <laughs> seconds, like, what are you, artist? What, what, what did you tell them? What kind of lies are you peddling to the Huffington Post? And, and sorry, you, the, the, what you had written for the Huffington Post did not include a drawing at the time? That was back in my, my uh, photographs of the whiteboard marker phase. Yeah, OK. Those early days. OK, so they were willing to bestow that title on you at the time. Yeah, I think they, I, I don't know what they were reading into it. Our artist was clearly a, a bit of a lofty title for it. But. Well, and then the Huffington Post isn't your sister, so I guess a little more lenient. Yeah, that's fair. You have sort of answered this a little bit, but if you had to sort of uh, really focus in, what would you say was your inspiration for uh, even just the blog, Math with Bad Drawings? Yeah, I think, it's interesting. I think my, my ambition is maybe actually, even as like my, the reach of the blog has grown and I've gotten to do these sort of exciting book projects, I think my ambition has probably narrowed a bit. I think at the start, I, I don't know, I started the blog when I was 24, 25. Um, yeah, 25. So I, I think at that time I had this idea that like good writing about mathematics could really like make it a, totally accessible to people for whom it was inaccessible, could like, um, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's hard for me to climb back inside the, the mindset. Because um, I think now I tend to take a little bit more of a systemic view, and there's a lot of big challenges in math education. And like a guy writing cartoons is not gonna, is not gonna transform anything particularly. Um, the way I think about it now is, uh, 
my goal is to give people positive experiences of mathematics. You know, whether they're someone who has a professional relationship to mathematics or someone, I mean, especially people who don't have that kind of relationship for whom mathematics was, uh, was kind of a bane and was a, was a, a difficulty in their schooling years. Um, not that I expect my, my drawings and my writing to, to like suddenly turn them into Googlers, uh, but to maybe help them just have like a, a day of reconciliation and kind of a nice, have a couple laughs with mathematics uh, is how I think about it. Yeah, because I guess they don't really, they aren't, you're not writing a curriculum, you're just uh, sort of taking individual one-off ideas. Yeah, exactly. And then there's brilliant people out there. I mean, I know some people who work on curricular stuff, uh, and it's really interesting to me. Curricular also. cartoons? Uh, cartoons, that would be cool, man. No, yeah. no, I don't, I don't know a lot of people doing that. But, but designing curriculum and sort of new, new Common Core aligned curricula. Uh, and that's really cool work and, and not, uh, yeah, not what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm just making jokes. So uh, you mentioned challenges in, in math education and you have significant experience in that area yourself. So what do you think are uh, like current and important challenges in math education? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think definitely there's, and for I mean, probably a lot of people in this room have interesting thoughts on this, uh, but how mathematics is going to adapt to you know, the fact that in the last 20 years, the technological environment has completely transformed. Uh, education tends to be pretty slow moving, but not, not like infinitely slow moving. I think you already see a bit of a shift away from some of the computational emphasis in the younger grades. Um, I saw even just like middle schoolers, it's not, it's less about, uh, I don't know, like it was very important I don't know, when we were in school, like you had to learn to divide a five digit number by a two digit number. Yeah. And like, eh, they don't really like, and, and honestly, it's not that, I, this is a controversial one, but I don't think that's a particularly important skill. I think being able to execute the algorithm with a one-digit number, sure. Uh, under being able to estimate is a really important skill and probably a harder one than executing the standard algorithm. Uh, so that's sort of one general um, issue, I think, is how, yeah, how math education will adapt to the new technological environment. And are you saying that it still is the case that there's a big computational emphasis uh, when you're younger and you think that's one thing that sort of needs to change? Yeah, yeah. Or do it's, you it, see that change happening already? So. It's true. I mean, the classrooms are so diverse that I think, I think there's still definitely lots of classrooms where teachers are teaching in a pretty traditional way and not really acknowledging the reality that like, we've, all, we've all got a calculator in our pocket and the calculator is better than any calculator you could get 20 years ago. Uh, and so there's, there's definitely classrooms where like, it's time to kind of update and acknowledge that, that the set of skills that's important has changed. Um, but but for, every, um, for any classroom that has one problem, you can always find a classroom with the opposite problem. So I'm, I'm always a little wary of trying to prescribe general solutions. Prescribe screen time and you know, yeah. skipping the, the work. But I remember that uh, in, in elementary school, there were always like a lot of people who were very challenged by exactly what you're talking about, by like, long division and long multiplication. And yeah. it's like, very frustrating. Um, on a different tack, uh, like, what, is your, what did your book writing process like, look like for Math with Bad Drawing? Yeah, yeah. So the, the book is in, is in five sections. The first one is sort of a very general introduction to mathematics. Uh, and then the next four uh, kind of each take, you know, there's one on probability and one on geometry and one on statistics. Uh, and so basically I, I spent like, I was teaching at the time, so I spent a few months kind of like, you know, sort of like opening a document and looking it over and like changing three words here or there uh, and like kind of fussing with it. And like that was, that was always the way I'd written because um, before that people weren't really paying me to write and I just could do it when I wanted. Uh, and then I did that for a few months and then looked up and was like, oh, I need to write a chapter every four days now in order to, <laughs> in order to finish the book on time. Uh, and what that meant is I started writing really fast. Uh, and luckily, the, so it was sort of that first section of the book I got to kind of fiddle with. And then the later sections are much more modular. I had sort of, um, with a lot of help from my editor, come up with basically spots in the world where you've got useful mathematics, uh, and mathematics that's really low to the ground, you know, where you don't need a chapter on expected value or something like that, where you don't need uh, a lot of background to, to access the mathematics. Um, and then it was sort of, you know, got a few days per chapter to kind of dive in and like, you know, spend a day or two doing background reading. Um, four days, I mean, it may have been more like a week, I guess, per chapter that I had. It sort of, yeah. As I, as I fell behind, I had it to It still accelerate. sounds pretty overwhelming, though. It felt really fast, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with how the book came out, and, and certainly the, um, my publisher does a really beautiful job just designing the physical book itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so the process was, um, was very leisurely at the beginning, and then, and then a lot faster. And who's the publisher again? Uh, it's Black Dog and Leventhal's. You know, my imprint there, they're an uh, imprint of Hachette. How long did it take in total, including both like the slow moving part at the beginning of the writing process and like finishing the final yeah. draft? Yeah, I guess we so probably got the book deal in October and then 
spend a few months kind of outlining. Um, and again, my editor was really good. She sort of pushed back on uh, what I think is a natural tendency. Like my degree is in pure mathematics, so I have a certain like blithe confidence that just like oh, yeah, prime numbers just interesting for their own sake. <laughs> <laughs> like for some, for some people they are, uh, but that was what like I, I had. I think in my original outline I had planned like several chapters on prime numbers and then kind of hitting RSA encryption at the end of that and, and in very non-technical terms. And she was sort of saying it's it's not. <laughs> for the sort of book we're hoping to do, lots of pure mathematics with a payoff in something fairly technical, like wasn't really like we want like lottery tickets, like that. That's that's the kind of level. Like the Death Star is another chapter. Um, <laughs> so I think orienting me back towards stuff that was uh, real world stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Real world stuff like the Death Star. Exactly. Really, just concrete stuff you run into every day. Uh, yeah, so, so it was outlining at the beginning, um, yeah, and, and, so, and sort of bouncing ideas back and forth with my editor, and then uh, probably three months or so mostly working on that first section at a fairly inefficient clip, and then, um, and then a pretty hasty like five months or so. Uh, I don't think those numbers add up to the correct amount, but, but don't, don't check. <laughs> There's no way of knowing, really. I don't think I have a calculator nearby. So. <laughs> That's exactly what I do. <laughs> um, did you find anything really surprising about either um, the writing process or the publishing process, aside from the fact that like a book mostly about prime numbers um, might not be <laughs> Wait, perfect for the audience. I was, I was shocked to find that that's not something. Yeah, my my, my editor, right, who's uh, right, you know, has edited lots of pop science books, but is you know her background's not in mathematics. So it turned out coming to her with a proposal that was like one third about prime numbers wasn't <laughs> wasn't striking her fancy. Uh, yeah, well, actually, I mean, both. So so I've, I just finished the manuscript for the second book with the same publisher now. Um, I think both books have really surprised me. I mean, it's just like a scale of writing project that I hadn't done before. Um, Math of Bedrock really pleasantly surprised me because I had, I was really excited the opportunity to write the book. I was like a little pessimistic or a little skeptical that like you could, that I could write a book I'd be satisfied with that was about math. Um, that struck me as too broad a topic. Like you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't hire a history teacher to write a book about like history. <laughs> Like just uh, give, yeah. give us the greatest hits of history, you know, <laughs> just an overview of history. Like it's just, it's like too much. Or like science, you wouldn't be like, oh yeah, like science teacher, just you know, just, like, just science, you know, just cover it. Isn't that like how most of the textbooks we had in like middle school were actually defined? Yeah, uh, right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them great pieces of literature. No, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's true. Yeah, most of the textbooks are like that. Um, if you look at like sort of like your your pop science shelf or something, you know, you don't. Mary Roach doesn't sit down and write a book about science. She writes a book about human digestion, or she writes a book about corpses, because um, she, she has a really wacky sense of what's exciting. Uh, but, you know, or like Stephen Hawking didn't, I mean, brief history of time. That's a pretty sweeping topic, but it's still not attempting to do all of physics exactly. Um, so that's it, it was amazing that you got all of math. Uh, yeah, that's it. That it, it covers the whole thing. You won't find anything missing. Um, yeah, basically, I mean, it's a bit of a, like a, uh, a magic illusion kind of trick to make it feel like it's got breadth while still having enough depth in a few topics. Um, and I was, I was basically just surprised how how it came together to feel like a cohesive package. Um, yeah, so I was very pleased with that. With the second book, um, I had a premise that I thought was brilliant. It was it was going to go through calculus and sort of connect each concept in calculus to something in the humanities, some kind of like to an author or a painter or someone who had sort of played with the same ideas, uh, which I thought was really clever and would have been if there, were, if there were people in the humanities who had done that with every idea of calculus. It turned out I had like three. And so it <laughs> made for a pretty artificial book. So I, I spent maybe four months writing a draft of that uh, and then basically had to start from page one because it was, there were, you know, there were like three or four chapters where it fit perfectly uh, and then others where I was just trying to shoehorn together things that didn't fit. Um, so that one, that surprised me. I'm, I'm really happy with the draft now. It's much more about storytelling now. And this is the one you showed, uh, change, change is the only yeah, constant? Yeah, change is the only constant, yeah. Cool. Um, one of the things I wanted to jump to is, uh, like, what would your readers who haven't met you in person find most surprising about you, do you think? There's this weird, like, asymmetry where when I talk to friends or family members who read the book, they always say, oh, it's so, it sounds just like you. That's exactly what, like, the page really captures you. And when I meet people who know the book and then they meet me, they're like, you're really not what I expected. <laughs> it's really, really nothing like I was anticipating. So what were they expecting? I, I don't know. I think uh, I, I, I'm, I'm more of a writer than a performer, so I think probably I come across as like a very, on the page I try to come across as a very like freewheeling, circusy kind of joke making kind of person, but like I don't, I'm not, I, I don't know, I'm just kind of a guy. Uh, <laughs> I just, so I don't, I'm, not, I'm not as much of a performer in person. Uh, so I think that, that surprises people a little bit. Um, Interesting. And also for readers of your 
uh, blog and your books. Uh, what would you tell them you are doing when you are not writing? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, or so, doing you know stuff like this. Right, exactly. I yeah, know I'm just constantly. I mean, I'm just hanging out in here now. This is a really nice room. <laughs> this would be my new hobby. Uh, yeah, it's a little funny because I, I went from. I mean, during the start of my teaching career, teaching was my day job, and writing was then cartooning was sort of this passion project hobby. Um, and now, when your passion project hobby becomes your professional activity, it sort of leaves. I, I'm in like this weird position now where I haven't I haven't taught in a year and a half now, and I'm really really anxious to get back to the classroom. That's it's just like there's so much energy there um, in a way that just being at my, you know, in a coffee shop typing is like a little, little less electric than, than being around young people who are learning new things. Uh, so that's, I think that's sort of what, yeah, th th that's this weird kind of state that I'm in right now is having switched my hobby and my, and my day job. So you just spend most of your, the rest of your time like wishing you were back yeah, in the classroom. Yeah, pining for the classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I like reading a lot. Um, yeah, I, I, I try to read sort of eclectic, weird things because um, I want to write weird, eclectic things. Yeah, it seems like a good practice then. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, let's uh, jump to maybe some audience and some Dory question. Let's start with you. Hey, hey. so first, thanks so much. That was an awesome demonstration of some illustrations. Um, I thought the quote you brought up from Andrew Wiles was particularly moving and interesting and also relevant for a lot of the work that's done here, too. And so as somebody who's taught computer science at the high school level, I was wondering um, you know, about that like building up comfort and discomfort, like super important skill for math, super important skill for other things. What pedagogical tactics do you take both as a teacher and as an author and illustrator to help instill that sense into students? Yeah, I think it, it's, mm, it's hard to instill as an as a illustrator writer because that's, it's in kind of inherently passive medium. I'm not there in the room with someone. Uh, as a teacher, I mean, you can, you can sort of describe stories like that as a, as a writer, but it doesn't have the same impact as actually having the experience. Um, as a teacher, there's really no substitute for just having students in that situation. Um, so coming up with problem, I mean, the, the sort of ideal, right, is to have a problem that is a sort of low barrier to entry where you can kind of wrap your head around what you need to do, um, where there's some kind of intrinsic excitement to it, where you kind of you want the solution to this puzzle, uh, and then to let them go, you know, to not, uh, to not provide answers, to not drop hints. Um, there's this art. My, my sister is also a math teacher, and she's really good at the art of the kind of non-judgmental, like, uh-huh, huh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Where someone, a student will propose an idea, and you, you, like, you really don't want to, like, I, I'm always tempted to be like, yeah, 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 you're on the right track. Um, or like, oh, that's not sounding good. Uh, but to really cultivate the, like, the, just the non-judgmental, OK, cool, that, that's an interesting idea. Tell me more about that. Uh, and I think, yeah, I mean, if that's, this is always what it comes down to in education, is what we spend time on is what kids will perceive that we value. Um, so if it's, you know, nine days out of 10 is sort of technique, and here's a technique, and now practice it, here's a technique, now practice it, you know, that, that's an important part of math. But if that's nine days out of 10, kids think that's 90% of the subject. Um, and so it, you just, it just takes spending classroom time on here's a problem, and you're going to work on it, and you won't know how to solve it, and I'll try to give you some models for thinking about it. I'll try maybe do a simpler example on the board, try to get conversation going. Uh, but really just getting students' experience with, with being in that space. Well, thank you for the in-depth answer. Um, can we show the Dory on the screen for a second? But the first question here I think is very interesting. How can we remove the stigma in young children of math is hard, I shouldn't bother, and anyone actually good at it should be beaten up? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not convinced that they shouldn't be beaten up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, I didn't. Right, there's, there's a lot there. Uh, math is hard, I mean, there, there's sort of two approaches to that. One is to say, oh, no, no, math, yeah, it's fun. It's so you can get along with it. And then to say, like, yeah, math, math is hard. That's kind of what's cool about it. Like, it, it, it stretches your mind, and it's a chance to, to challenge yourself and to dive into ideas that will change the way you think. Um, so I think that's one where, you know, as educators, you want to own math is hard. You don't want to uh, dismiss that. It's okay that it's hard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that, that's what's beautiful about it is that it's hard. Um, I mean, yeah, if you think about kids, things that kids find intrinsically exciting, uh, no one's like, well, soccer is too hard or too easy. Like, that's just not, you don't think about it in those terms. It's like, to become a great soccer player is really hard. To play a little soccer is, is fun and not too hard. Um, and it's just the activity itself is, is motivating. Uh, which I guess, is in, when it comes to I shouldn't bother. Um, that's sort of what it comes down to. It, it, uh, soccer and, and things like guitar and musical instruments are analogies I think about a lot, because those are things that kids are, are kind of inherently excited about often, not, not all kids. Uh, 
but those, you know, music and, and sport are things that we can just dive into and be excited about. Um, and why isn't math one of those things for most kids? And I think it's because they don't, it's pretty rare to have a glimpse of what, what like, doing great math looks like. Uh, I don't know when most kids would see that. You can turn on the TV and see soccer. You can turn on the, not radio, because it's 2019, but, you know, turn on whatever music app you use uh, and hear what great guitar sounds like. Uh, but like, where do you look for great math? And so I think part of what math education has to do is to show what does really exciting, engaging, interesting mathematical problem solving look like, um, to show the exemplar of, of what we're aiming at. It's a really interesting problem to solve. Yeah, because it's, it's such a technical field that it can be hard. Um, sometimes the, yeah, like w what is great math to someone who knows the background is illegible to someone who doesn't know the background. Mm -hmm. Let's take another question from the audience. So I guess you can boil down my question is, how do you answer that question yourself? Um, so I remember math from high school being rote and boring, and well, who really cares about algebra 2 in the first place? Right, yeah. And then math from college and grad school being, oh, look, yeah, here's these theorems. There's 500 ways to prove it. Which way do you prove it? Um, how do you, or do you try to bring that more creativity and proof creation into high school, or is that even the tact you want to take? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question, right? So proof in particular, I mean, for you ask any mathematician, proof is the heart of the subject, right? How do we move from this, this Euclidean idea? How do we move from, from assumptions to conclusions? Uh, the place it tends to show up in the US, like your first encounter often, is, um, is geometry, where you do these two-column proofs. Uh, and I, I have not super positive feelings about two-column proofs. They tend to be, it's like a kind of artificial way of setting them up. Um, and also, you run into the problem that when you're developing any axiomatic system, the early proofs are usually very technical and sort of about like just following out from your definitions and kind of it takes a while before you get into the meat of it. So you know, if you start with Euclid, you've got these five really simple postulates and then the first few things you prove are just feel blindingly obvious when you look at them. Uh, and so it's not a great playground for proof in that sense. It's like weird to start your proof experience by proving things. Like what you learn is that rather than proof helping you understand things that you didn't, Proof is when you get confused about things you thought you understood, <laughs> which like isn't, isn't really the message we want to send. Uh, so how do I mean? I think I think doing more um, informal argument. Almost any mathematical solution can be presented as some as sort of an argument, something kind of like a proof. And I think doing that um, much earlier with students and much more frequently and on problems where it's not blindingly obvious what you're trying to prove. Because uh, I think you need to have a fair amount of informal experience with mathematical argument before you can appreciate formal mathematical proof. Let's look at another question from the Dory here, because this looks fun. Uh, can you name some writing or writers of popular mathematics that you have been inspired by or liked? Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. I, I try to read as much as I can sort of in the popular math space. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of really good, I mean, so uh, Simon Singh's Fermat's, uh, Fermat's Enigma is the title in the US, Fermat's Last Theorem in the UK. Um, but that's, that's one of the best kind of pop math books out there. The US uh, title sounds a lot better. Fermat's Enigma? Yeah. Yeah, it's true, yeah. yeah. Enigmas are more fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, the uh, theorem is not, yeah, that's probably why they changed it. Yeah. yeah we're better at marketing here in America. Please go on. Uh, um, so, and then other recent ones, I mean, Jordan Ellenberg has a book called How Not to Be Wrong, which is great. Uh, Steve Strogatz has a book called Joy of X, which is a, like a really wonderful sort of like ABC of mathematics, starting from counting and building towards some more modern mathematics. Uh, Eugenia Chang has a really fun book called, uh, there's another one with different titles in the US and UK, but I think it's How to Bake Pie in the US, where she, she's a category theorist and kind of explores some analogies between cooking and mathematics. Uh, right, those come to mind. Biographies of mathematicians are often good. Siobhan Roberts is a biographer I really like. She wrote a good biography of uh, John Conway called Genius at Play. Um, uh, Martin Gardner is obviously a master of the, of the discipline. I mean, sort of recreational mathematics. Um, I've only read you know, bits of what he's written. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is a long list, so it's helpful. Okay, well, yeah. I'll stop there. <laughs> um, but on that topic, do you think that uh, math is generally getting more popular these days? Like, what's going on there? Yeah, there's definitely like, I feel like there's a bit of a like pop math or math popularization sort of renaissance going on. It probably goes along with uh, like a renewed emphasis on STEM communication. That seems like something also that, I, I don't know if it's um, social media lends itself to that or just like the, um, 
the fact that visuals really benefit science and math communication, and now that we've all got like pretty good screens around us all the time, you can have these beautiful visuals in a way that 30 years ago, it was actually a little harder. To, I mean, TV specials could do it, but, um, but it was harder as like sort of a, just a random writer to, to communicate with great visuals. Um, yeah, the, the visual is probably part of it. I think YouTube is actually a really good medium for math, too. It's not, I, that's, mm -hmm. I'm much more knowledgeable about the book side than the, the video side, uh, but there's a lot of people doing really good stuff. Uh, if, if any of you have come across Three Blue, One Brown, um, he's like a master of the form. Um, his YouTube videos are exceptionally good. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, cool. no, he's, yeah. Looks like we have another question in the audience. One of the math authors that I really admire and math education practitioners is yeah. Paul Lockhart, who wrote A Mathematician's Lament. Yeah. And in that book and in some other like earlier studies, uh, he commented on how we've got this systemic problem in math education where people go through primary education, learn that math is horrible and they hate it, they become math teachers, and they <laughs> teach students that math is horrible and they hate it. Um, do you see other sort of systemic level ways to approach that problem and break that cycle other than being a person who understands a different perspective on math and exemplifying that just yourself? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Lockhart's Lament, I, uh, it was my first or second year teaching, I think, that I read it, and it was like, it was such a, uh, a like, just this blinding light of that essay. I thought I was just loved that essay. Uh, right, it opens with this... Um, this metaphor where he compares math education to art education, and does this whole extended metaphor where it's sort of, I'm not gonna remember the details of it, but basically, oh no, sorry, music education first, I guess. Um, so he compares math education to music education, and imagines a world in which music education is mandatory for everyone from K through 12, and it consists of like transposing series of notes into different keys, and kind of, you know, like breaking up things by measure and figuring out the time signature from looking at sheet music. And you never hear any music, you just look at sheet music and manipulate sheet music in various ways, uh, which is a really grim metaphor for math education <laughs> and not entirely wrong. Uh, I think I, I really admire Lockhart's idealism. I think probably in the last, in the last uh, eight years or whatever it's been since I read that essay, um, I've gotten a little more pessimistic about the ability of just like an idealistic vision to help transform mathematics education. Because I think in particular, one of the roles it plays in education is as a platform for competition. Um, so in particular, you know, AP calculus is taken by I don't know, half a million students, quarter million students a year. Um, it's a pretty common thing to do in the US. I think it's driven largely by the fact that to get admission to a competitive college, it really helps to do AP calculus. Um, it's not as though calculus teachers sat down and said, let's make this a competitive environment. Uh, it's that like, you know, the economy has some zero sum elements to it. Um, and for whatever reason, we see math education and success in math education as a signal of competence. Um, and so I think part of what drives math education being as, as occasionally uh, dry and disappointing as it is, is that, um, is that competitive pressure, uh, the fact that students want a platform on which to compete um, so they can prove themselves. And once you have a platform on which to compete, well, you kind of want very fair, objective tests. Uh, but once you're doing very fair, objective, predictable stuff, you've kind of drained a lot of the life out of, of what makes mathematics cool and fun. Uh, I don't know, I mean, the competitive pressure isn't gonna go away. So to some extent, I, I don't think there's an easy fix for that other than to move the competition to some other platform. Um, that's not, yeah, that, that, that's not a problem I feel like I have any, uh, any prescription for. That was an eloquent uh, summary of, a, of the problem, though. So thank you. Why don't we take one more question from the audience? So one thing I've noticed looking at your older drawings and your newer ones is actually not the drawings, but the handwriting. Like, mm -hmm. the handwriting in your earlier ones is, like, really pretty bad, and in newer <laughs> ones, like, I can read what they're saying. And I'm wondering yeah. if you've, like, switched to using a font for this, yeah. or if your handwriting has gotten better? No, no, I, I switched to using a font. Yeah, mm -hmm. for the book, they, uh... Oh, can you, can, can we, can we look at the examples again? Uh, sure, or, yeah. Were yeah, the examples the, present in the slides? It should be there, yeah. Yeah, so the, the more see. recent ones in the slides, like, that, that one's okay, but once you start using Sharpies, yeah, uh, right, there's no text in on that one. Uh, right, like, this like one. That's, that's pretty hard to read. Yeah, that is tough to read. Um, and then, right, also pretty tough to read. And then if you go to the current ones, still not great. Uh, it was actually for the, that's still handwriting. Yeah, so this is oh. the font now. I was thinking maybe like Ben like put some work into figuring this out. Absolutely, absolutely. Different kind not. of work. No, you, did, actually, you didn't make this font. 
it was a very cool experience. This was my uh, my publisher told me actually they needed a font for the book because the had like you can't. I mean, the things I learned about publishing that I probably should have known in advance. You can't just submit like handwritten scrawl <laughs> and like they're like you know they're, they're like we need to copy edit this. We might translate it. Like we need to provide files to people. Like you can't. We can't just take your scrawl. That's not that's not going to work. So they what they did is they sent me to a man named Chank who lives in the Twin Cities. And I don't, he must have a last name, but I know him only as Cenk. Uh, and he had, me, he had me draw, like, you know, write the alphabet a couple times and write some other characters. He threw in some, like, Greek letters for me. I got to write Greek letters, and that's if I can figure out how to make that happen in my word processor. Um, and he turned it into, like, this lovely font that looks like my handwriting, but, but is way better. That's <laughs> really cool. <laughs> Uh, how much does Chank charge? For the, you know, is this something I can do for myself? Uh, yeah, yeah, you could if you wanted. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's. I mean, you know, it's not. It's not cheap, but it's affordable. All right, Chank. Um, so I have one last question, which is: uh, Is there anything in particular that you think Googlers should learn from your writing, or maybe from your experiences? Yeah, uh, no, that's a good question. I, I mean. I, I, I probably have a lot more to learn from, uh, I mean, I always enjoy talking to Googlers and, and hearing how things work here. Uh, I mean, the thing, the thing I've been doing, especially with these two books, is figuring out ways to write about a very technical subject in very non-technical ways. Mm -hmm. um, and the basic reason being that, like, technicality is often a barrier to entry. Um, you know, people run into, you know, the, the dense symbolism of mathematics, uh, and it, people just kind of bounce off and, and go away. Uh, and so, yeah, thinking about how to communicate about about complex technical things in in clear and sort of um, yeah easily transmitted ways. I mean, that's sort of the role of a, any kind of math or science popularizer, I guess. Um, but I think the the tools that math and science popularizers come up with might be useful in a in an environment where you know you guys all have the technical background, but also there's still even for someone with the technical background, it's slower to to read a technical document than to read a, uh, a non technical summary. Like what you've done. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come here and, and talk to us. Yeah, no, thank you. No, it's been really The fun. writing experience and uh, your teaching experience. And I think it's been really enlightening for all of us. So, so yeah, thank you very much. Cool. All right, thanks.